What's up, friends? This is Thag, and you're watching Thag's Dino Reviews and Paleo Politics. Uh, as I said last post, we would be coming up with the sauropod. Uh, this is not an actual review of the model itself. Rather, it's a review of just how scientifically accurate this animal is. Uh, however, before that, I just want to make one notation, and one mention. Uh, a well-known magazine, probably many of you know it, is Prehistoric Times. They went ahead and published a letter uh, uh, that I wrote to them about my concerns over dinosaur skeletons at auction. And uh, I thought that was very nice of them. Let me get this a little bit better for you there. Okay. And uh, anyway, uh, they have also indicated they're going to be more uh, proactive on helping to at least get the word out about the crisis of uh, North American dinosaurs being sold at auction. So there you go. Who, who knew? Anyway, uh, today's uh, review is on Diplodocus carnegie. And basically, this is the one that is built by Eofauna. And probably most of you know of Eofauna. If you don't, you can go online and look at their website. Uh, basically, what they say is that they're trying to build the most accurate models uh, regarding dinosaurs and other extinct life forms. And uh, the way they're doing this is they're using... Uh, muscular skeleton drawings, musculoskeletal drawings, and all the pertinent research data that's available from museums or papers that have been published that is online. And they're coming up with um, what seems to be a pretty neat dinosaur. This model here uh, really, in my opinion, probably comes to just about as close as you can to what a Diplodocus looked like. Now, as most of you probably already know, there's a large movement afoot to really uh, start drawing and painting and sculpting dinosaurs as the way they really looked. They're putting an all-out effort into this. Scientists, artists, uh, writers, everybody, uh, magazine publishers. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, I say let's take a look. Now on this, I'm only going to be able to comment on the things that I know uh, that are pretty accurate and that are uh, really, in my opinion, uh, the most recent with the, with the best information that we have. Okay, so with that thought in mind, let's start where we always do, at the head, and see what we come up with. Now, if you look at the head, it's, uh, it's, it's very small. It's like a sauropod, no question about it. But if we move this around just a little bit closer, let me get it to the right. One thing they did here, and you probably won't be able to see it, is right at the end of the snout, uh, just above the premaxilla, is uh, two little fleshy tubes that represent the nostrils. Now, the nostril opening in the cranium was up high, um, behind, you know, post, post orbital. It's that far back. Um, uh, so the thinking is, and it's pretty well accepted right now, but, but it could go either way. But still, the thinking is there were two little fleshy tubes that extended down from the nares and came all the way down to about the top of the premaxilla. And that's where the, uh, the openings were. Now, uh, you got to ask yourself why. Well, one good reason why and I think it's the right reasoning, 
is that you need the nostril openings close to the mouth somehow. Uh, most modern day animals, we don't see too many that have the, uh, the nasal passages very far from the mouth at all. And it really makes sense. So score that one for eofauna. Uh, the next thing is the neck. Long, thin. Now, you have to remember, this is a diplodocid, uh, but so is a patasaurus. But if you've ever been to the Carnegie Museum and looked at the two skeletons side by side, the Apatosaurus is a real heavyweight with an unbelievably heavy neck, same, same amount of vertebra, cervical vertebra, but uh, a much more robust, heavily built animal than Diplodocus. Now, as far as Diplodocus goes, it has 15 cervical vertebrae, However, the vertebrae in its neck are longer than they are wide. Completely different from the Apatosaurus. And that's what gives us this long, lightly built neck. And let me give you a little better shot of that. Yep. And another thing, too, that I think is critical on this... The neck is in the quote-unquote osteological neutral pose. In other words, that's supposed to be where this thing is completely at rest. That's it. And if you look at the skull, you can see that the skull is angled downwards, but not too severely, but definitely angled downward. And that way it can get a good field of view. Uh, current thinking is that the head in the neutral position is about level with the hips. So, again, Eofauna is right on the money. Uh, I assume that if they read the same papers and the same books that I did, they would have come up with that information, and it seems like they really did. Uh, anyway, okay, now, if you look at the top of the neck, you'll see a series of uh, spinal derms. That's those little pointed things sticking up. And those are, they have been found. Now the late Stephen Zirkus, back in 1993, went back to the Howe Quarry where, that had become famous from Barnum Brown in the 1930s when he found all the sauropod uh, skeletons, what he called the thirsty lot of dinosaurs. And uh, Zirkus went back there, and he found a lot more stuff that they had, they had missed. And actually, the Hal Quarry now is in, I think, three different uh, segments. Of course, Barker Howe, who is an old guy in the 30s, is long gone. But I'm, I believe some of his family still own the land, and... And those and the new owners are all uh, on board with trying to find more fossils. Anyway, Zirkus went there. He found uh, several more uh, bones, uh, a tail section. And he found a lot of these dermal spines that you see on the top of this. And in addition to this, if you get a chance, read his paper. It's very informative. And it shows, uh, now, one thing. The spines that he found are all on the caudal vertebrae. And they go right up to the hips and stop. Then there, he, he can't find any more. And he didn't find that many on the length of the whole tail. However, he found some of them that were up to 7 inches long. That's pretty significant. Uh, and he found some of them, if you look right here, you'll see that it goes down the back, out the tail, then it goes high again, then down low, and eventually they taper off down at the end of the tail. That's exactly how he found them. And uh, they surmised that they must have went up across the back and probably up in a declining size to the skull. Um, neat. Very neat. And uh, that really gave us, he said these looked a lot like modern day Tutaras, and that's probably true. I think, I think they do. Um, but he found that. 
And here in this model, quite frankly, they are represented perfectly. Okay. The next thing that I looked at was uh, in 1968-69 and beyond, Robert Bacher, Dr. Robert Bacher, wrote a series of magazine articles that basically set the whole paleontological world on its head. Uh, he postulated that uh, dinosaurs were not swamp-bound overweight creatures that were on an evolutionary dead end, but rather they were active, vibrant, uh, healthy uh, animals that uh, really were the chief denizens of the earth for an incredibly long time, and rightfully so should have been there. And uh, very active, possibly on the verge of being warm-blooded the whole bit. And he wrote one nice article about sauropods, and uh, he made a number of observations that still stand today, definitely. Uh, several things. First, the legs were long and column-like. Column -like. Uh, they they uh, didn't weren't spread out like a, a, a lizard but they were tucked directly underneath the body. And that is absolutely true. And that is a trait of a terrestrial dwelling creature, not somebody that was living in the swamp. And if you look at the front legs, particularly the manis, the hands, you'll see that they're small and they're crescent-shaped. And by that I mean the bones of the foot were almost vertical and they had a tendency to walk pretty much on their toes if you want to look at it like that. And that's what's called a digigrade uh, track, a digigrade stance. And if you look closely, the inside uh, number one digit is a large uh, claw Scientists call that the pollux. Uh, field paleontologists call it the logger's pike. Anyway, it's huge, and uh, there's still some controversy about its use. But nonetheless, this was clearly a animal meant to walk on land. The next thing was the rear legs, and they were heavy enough to support the weight of this animal and uh, also if you look at the back legs while you didn't really have claws on the front manis like except for the uh, pollux on the back the back foot the number one claw inside is called the hallux and they had three claws on each foot and those claws are what drove the plodicus forward and behind that array of claws was a large flat, or excuse me, a large uh, cushion of fat, uh, a pad, like a shock absorber, that was the back of the foot. Very much like what an elephant has today. And that would help uh, take up some of the shock from each step. And that is exactly the way it is. And again, this is a trait of a wholly terrestrial animal. And once again, I think Eofauna got it right on the money. I mean, I, you know, I, I know they have all these papers and access to this museum research and all that, but so do a lot of other sculptors, but they didn't seem to quite get it. Now, here's another thing right here. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, well, let me go back, okay. Right there. Another thing that Bacher stated that I thought was very accurate, and we see this in a number of sauropods. If you've ever been to a museum and actually seen uh, any of the original skeletons on the sauropods and the way they're mounted, you'll see this right away. But the ribs on each side are almost slab-sided. They, they practically come straight down. 
They're not bulged out like a hippo or an elephant or anything like that. They literally are slab-sided. And if you look at the, this animal from that view, you can see that is definitely the case. And again, this is another adaptation, in my opinion, for living on land. Did they uh, live near the margins of lakes and rivers and streams and all that and lagoons? Yes, they did. Um, but their neck was so long that they could uh, have a huge feeding envelope. So that meant they could feed from the ground and up to a certain height. Now right now, uh, there's a lot of speculation on exactly how high the head could go. Um, I'd like to think that it could go, you know, a, a little bit higher than what it is now anyway. It's uh, probably 10, 12 feet off the ground. Uh, and I would like to think it could go maybe 15 or 20. Because, if not, this is an ambush, ambush predator's delight. They would come right out of the jungle and snatch onto this head and all of a sudden there was a big meal seized, sized up right in front of them. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. I think the bigger animals definitely could see up higher. But they did have a large feeding envelope. Um, they could uh, eat from the ground. And we know this because of the wear patterns on their dentition. Uh, indicating that they were eating some vegetation that definitely had uh, soil and grit in it and it was wearing their teeth down. And it is estimated that they could replace all of their teeth in uh, something like 35 or 40 days. It was a really fairly short amount of time. Anyway, okay. So, uh, the next thing that I think is very important is the fact that the animal had something like 80 vertebrae in the tail, 80 caudal vertebrae. And of course the lower ones are the double the double chevrons, that's where it got its name, Diplodocus, which just simply means double beam lizard. And uh, I think that if you look at the, the outline of this tail and the size of it in relation to the rest of it, and the tail makes up well over uh, one-third of the total developed length of this animal. Um, and it ends in a kind of a whip-like fashion. Now, it might have been a defensive tool. I uh, can't really say for sure, but it's pretty, pretty likely that they at least uh, slapped them around a little bit, maybe not making sonic booms and that sort of thing, but but clearly capable of fending others away. And it really looks good in that sense. Okay, another thing that I want to point out to you, which also makes this model a little bit of a standout, is the scale patterns on it. Now, you probably won't see it, be able to see it from there, and really you shouldn't be able to see it. Um, the scales are pretty small. At the Mother's Day Quarry, I believe in uh, Utah or Wyoming, I can't remember right now, but they did find uh, a, a fairly large chunk, or a couple of them actually, of uh, skin impressions of either... Diplodocus, Barosaurus, or Apatosaurus. You're not completely sure. They think it's Diplodocus, but what they look like was something like this. And if you stood away from them and looked at the size of the look at look say at the ribs of the Diplodocus, if you happen to have one handy, um, you would probably be able to discern these. Now, most models make the scales way too big, way too big, and uh, that's not the case with this model. Now, it may still be off a little bit just for the sake of sculpting it, but they're pretty close. 
and uh, I uh, I honestly think that that is a big plus in this. Now, according to a paper I read recently, they they found four different types of scales in four different shapes. And they were arranged in such a pattern that it's possible that this pattern of scales might have been used by other diplodocus or diplodoci to uh, identify a member of the same species. It, and actually that kind of makes sense. Um, but anyway, that's just another really fascinating factor about Diplodocus and about this model. So, if we look at it in the overall, uh, what's our assessment of this model? Well, from my perspective, I think it's one of the best Diplodocus models out there. It's very realistic. It uses all the scientific data that we really know and it's put together in a scientific method. And I, I really don't think that you're going to find any other Diplodocus that's going to come even close to this one. You might, but I'm not completely sure. Um, I, I don't think I've seen one yet. And I really went out of my way. As I've said before, I like models that make the animal look really organic. Is it a living animal in front of me? Could it be interpreted that way? Yes, in this case, uh, this is another big hit for Eofauna. They've got two or three others that I really like. And uh, I, I know we don't get a lot of models from them because they do a lot of work to get it to that point. And besides that, not only do they make models, they write books, they write uh, research papers, they do the research, and uh, it's, you know, they have to do a lot of travel and work. They have to get the drawings and everything and put it all together, and then they have to review the skeleton and the muscular system and see how it works. Anyway, if you do not have Eofauna's 140th scale, Diplodocus carnega in your collection, I highly, highly recommend that you get it. This is an excellent, excellent model, and it really, truly um, sets the stage for just a whole lot of models that are going to come down the pike made the exact same way. I mean, literally. And like I said before, right now there's a huge foot a movement afoot in the science to really get to understand what dinosaurs truly look like. Uh, there's a number of guys that have written great papers, Darren Nash, uh, the late Stephen Zirkus, uh, Dr. Brocker, uh, a whole host of uh, new guys and a whole host of paleo artists that are really breaking ground on this and I think this portends well for us dinosaur model collectors in the future. Anyway, okay, so if you like this show, please hit the alarm bell and the subscribe button. Um, I do have uh, uh, more work that I'm doing on the Save the Dinosaur Project. I want to end the practice of Western North American dinosaur skeletons going to auction. And that's going to be an all-hands-on-deck type effort. I can't do it by myself. I probably won't be able to do much of anything by myself. But I have gotten a nice response from the first letter I sent out. I got a nice letter back from David Attenborough. And, uh, excuse me, I mean uh, Richard Attenborough. David, no, David. And uh, I also have... Uh, sent out a number of letters to politicians so i don't know we'll see anyway i'm going to be looking for another model uh, it'll be out soon i'm truly considering lawrence's lawrence lamb's uh model uh lambiosaurus uh, a great great hadrosaur that he discovered way back when and it's really one of the the model that i've got is just 
beautiful. Uh, so be looking for that and more on the Save the Dinosaur project. You can see my little poster in the background. Uh, I'm going to get some copies made of that and see if I can't get them in a few magazines. Anyway, okay, I'm Thag. I'm yours for the discipline and I'll catch you on the rebound.